Let's try that again. Sorry about that. <laughs> In his book, Adopted by God, author and seminary professor Robert A. Peterson shares this story of a gentleman by the name of Patrick who shares why his adoption, his own personal adoption to his parents, and why the doctrine of adoption in the Christian faith is so near to his heart. He goes on to say this. He says, as an adopted child, the doctrine of adoption is real to me. Briefly, it reminds me that while I was without a future, a hope, even a family to belong to, Somebody gave me all of this and more. And this was done not because of anything I could ever give back in return for such a gift, but just because my parents wanted to, even wanted to express their love for somebody. And likewise, according to the word of God, God the Father chose me and adopted me so he could love me. And I will never fully understand why my parents or God chose me, but I'm forever humbled and just plain amazed that they did. Here's the thing about this illustration, this story. What resonates with me so much is this line right here. He says, we were without a future, a hope, and even a family to belong to. That was, that was our status. That's where we stood before Christ entered into our lives, right? In fact, we were once sinners separated from God. We were uh, orphaned sinners, right? But now we've become cherished children because of the work of Christ. And so this morning, we're going to be continuing our series on the names of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be focusing on the name of adoption. And we're going to see how adoption for us paints another beautiful picture of the gospel that sometimes we don't use enough when it comes to like evangelism and sharing, that we've gone from being separated, alienated, orphans, right, because of sin but because of what Christ stood in the gap for us, right? Now we've been brought into the family. We went from lost sinners to cherished children. And as we've been learning throughout this series on the names of the Holy Spirit, we've been learning that the Holy Spirit works to apply in our lives the finished work of Christ in our everyday that daily grind reminding us of what Christ has accomplished. In fact, this is what we've learned. If you guys remember, not too long ago, Andrew preached on the power of the Spirit, right? We learned that the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit, it's the catalyst for personal transformation in our lives, right? Not only that, it's also the power that serves as a catalyst for us to live as ambassadors of Christ, to be witnesses for advancing God's kingdom work. And today what we're going to do is we're going to learn how adoption reminds us of our new identity in Christ, and it empowers us because of that identity, to be a people who restores community while representing Christ. So let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17 about adoption. This is what he says. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Before we wrestle with what this means, I, I got to give you guys a little bit of context, a little bit of background of why Paul is writing this letter. So Paul is writing the book of Romans to a group of Christians. They're made up of both Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And they're kind of wrestling with, like, how do, we, how do we live out the implications of our newfound faith? You know, there might be some disagreements on do we how much do we follow the law? Or what about this? Do we do this or not do this? And so there's a little bit of conflict going on in the life of the church. So Paul's like, listen, I'm going to write this letter to you because I want to help both Jewish and Gentile Christians be united in the gospel that he preached. He wanted them to live as one family, as you guys have been hearing, so that they would comprehend how the gospel 
speaks to the issues that divided them. He's shown how Christ unites them and how the Spirit speaks to that. In fact, our big idea today is this. Because Jesus has set us free from slavery to sin and adopted us as his sons and daughters, we must live as children of God. So the question becomes, okay, Pat, well, yeah, we got to live as children of God, but what does that mean? How do, we, how do we live as children of God? Well, there's two ways that we primarily do that. First, we have to walk by the Spirit and not by this flesh. And two, we must let our identity as sons and daughters, our identity in Christ, drive our character in Christ. So let's look at our first point real quick from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, as we examine what it means to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Romans 8, 12, 13 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So Paul right here starts out by saying, first and foremost, that we have this, this obligation to God. What does he mean by this? To, to whom is our obligation supposed to be to? Right? Because aren't we saved, you know, by grace, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? What is, what, is, what is this obligation all about? And the simple answer is Christ. How do we know this? If you notice that Paul starts this scripture off with a therefore. And so when you see that, you know he's referencing something that he has said before, that's come previous. And so let's go to, uh, and, and, and so what he's trying to say is he's saying, listen, there's something consequential that has taken place that you need to be aware of that you have an obligation to pay back to Christ. So what, what, what is that obligation? If we go to Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says this. It says, and if by the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Listen, Paul's saying, listen, it's the same spirit that lives inside of you that's come to dwell inside of you. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead now lives inside of you. He's, he has made your spiritually dead heart beat again to be able to receive and to be alive in Christ. This means, this serves as a reminder that your ransom, your debt has been paid, right? The debt of sin has been paid. You're no longer enslaved to your sin because you've been set free by the work of Christ. We have a new master, a new king, one who is gentle and lowly in heart and who has brought us into his family. And this is why Paul goes on to say, he goes on to say, like, listen, you as you come to this family, you also have to put to death the misdeeds of our sinful nature. What he's basically saying is, listen, you have to wrestle with sin. You have to kill it. You have to put it to death. We call this the mortification of sin. It's, it's putting it to death, extinguishing it, get rid of it. How do we know this? In Romans chapter 8, verse 13, Paul says these words. He says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. As I said, when he uses that word misdeeds there, he's referencing sin within our lives. What you need to understand is this. We kind of live in this tension, right? Christ has already paid the price that needs to be paid for us, but we're still waiting for the consummation of his kingdom. We call this the already and the not yet. So as believers, yes, Christ has paid the price of our sin, but we still wrestle with our fleshiness, with our sinfulness, because we're no longer enslaved to it, but yet it still has effects on us until Christ comes to eradicate it once and for all. And so Paul's saying, listen, you have to wrestle with this. You have to go to war against sin if you want to walk by the flesh. And so we've got to ask ourselves the question, why should we put our sin to death? Because listen, friends, if you let sin reign in your life, then it will quench the Spirit of God from doing it powerful, transformative things in your life. What do I mean by quenching the Spirit? I mean this. To quench the Spirit means to live in our sin in such a way that it actually impedes the Spirit's ability to transform you and remake you into the image of Christ. I think of it this way. This may be a better way. Think of a fire. The Holy Spirit's been described as a fire or a light. If I were to smother that fire or that light, 
that's going to put the fire out. And if I put that fire out, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to limit the heat, the, the things that it gives me, the benefits, right? And so if we live in our sin, it's like we're smothering or putting out a flame or a light that stoked your faith. You need that fire. I like how um, Puritan author and pastor John Owen puts it. He said this about sin. He said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And what Owen says here and what Paul is telling us is that in this text is that Christians have to use their newfound freedom, their new identity in Christ, not to live for themselves and live how they see fit, but rather to live in a way that brings honor and glory to the name, to walk by the Spirit. And they have to put to death and resist sin. You have to go to war against your sinful tendencies. It's all out war. This means scorched earth. You have to, you have to stamp it out, extinguish it, get rid of it. Because if you don't proactively and ruthlessly go after sin, it will impede the Spirit's ability to work inside of you. So the question becomes, how do we kill sin? First thing we have to do is we have to call sin what it is. It's sin. We have to call sin what it is. It's sin. We have a tendency in our culture. We want to lessen the meaning of that word, so we call it like a misstep, a mistake, right? The skeletons in my closet, or my personal favorite that I see said a lot is when you know someone who keeps doing something over and over again, and then people excuse and say, well, that's just who they are and how they are. And it's like, no, <laughs> that's sin at work in someone's life. Because what you guys need to understand and what we all need to remember is that sin is the smearing of a relationship. It's the breaking of our holy bond with God. It's missing the mark. And the thing about sin is you can't sweep it under the rug and explain it away. You can try. You can't try to manage it. It'll keep popping up over and over again. The only thing you can do with sin is if you wanted to put it to death, the first step you have to take is you have to name it and you have to repent. You have to name it and repent. And I hate to break it to you. You will do this through your life as a Christian. This is the part and process of sanctification. It's constantly extinguishing and getting rid of sin in your life so you're becoming more and more like Christ each day of your life. And so not, not only do you have to name it, Right and repent of it, but you have to you have to remember you can't fight this battle alone. So you've heard us using the word family. If you want to fight against sin, guess what? You need your brothers and sisters in Christ. You need your family. You need accountability in your life if you want to grow. Let me share share this with you. I have two brothers for two years who poured their life into me here in this church. We were in a mentoring relationship, the three of us. It's my friend John and my friend Gary. And for two years, we walked through and examined what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we would meet for about an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes it went to as we were talking. You know, we grow really close in relationships. But that first part of that conversation, we would kind of check in with each other and see where we were at. And both those men had the freedom and the ability, even with me, you know, being in the position of ministry to say, hearing something going on in my life, they could call me out and say, Pat, I think what you said to Rachel that morning, you crossed the line and you sinned and you need to repent. And I'm just using that as an example, Rachel, because I'm sure you'll love to hear that. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. I had two brothers who were willing to say, listen, bro, you got to repent. You're in sin. But not only did they like call me out like just for fun to call me out, but they bared that burden with me. That's the Christian life. We bear each other's burdens. We fall together. We rise together. We are one family. And that's what those two brothers did. In fact, as we finished the two years, one of the coolest gifts I've ever received from a brother in Christ is we were meeting at 54 Bar Street and Grill down in Chesterfield. It was finally after COVID cleared. You could finally get out, go back out. And one of the gentlemen in the group, Gary, he bought us this beautiful Reformation. Two Bibles, actually, but this one I just love. It's a Reformation Heritage Bible, KJV. And he bought it for us just as a reminder that we have to stand on the word, that we have to let the word of God read us in such a way that it will expose our sin. And I knew, but it was through that relationship, through that accountability that I had brothers saying, you got to stand on the word. You have to, Pat, you need to look at this and probably repent of this. And we need that relationship. So my question to you all is this, who's speaking into your life? Who's speaking into your life? Do you have a brother or sister in Christ who 
will speak into the brokenness and sinfulness of your life in such a way that their wounds don't push you away, but they actually lead you to healing. We have to have that. There's no such thing as lone wolf Christianity. You can't do this on your own. And if you want to battle sin, you need your family. And that's why we practice church discipline. We do that because we know that if we want to walk in the salt and light, then we have to be doing our best to acknowledging sin and taking care of that problem. We need accountability. We need groups of people to speak into our lives. So, so not only must we walk by the Spirit by putting sin to death, but we also have to let our new identity in Christ as children of God drive our character. What do I mean by that? Let's look at verse 14 real quick, starting here. It says this. It says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. We're stamped, we're marked, right? The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. I mean, let that sink in. And we saw Jesus do that in Mark 14. He uses that exact same example. That's how he prays to God, to the Father. Paul here is using kind of a a Greco-Roman description to describe the adoption that we're experiencing in our new faith. We went from slaves to our sin with this inclination to fulfill our, our fleshly desires to now being adopted sons and daughters with new desires. In fact, in Rome, adopting a child meant that the child was freely chosen by his parents and desired by his parents. They were loved. They were called. You heard Andrew preach on this from Ephesians, right? This is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 says this. It says, for he chose us in him, so he chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption of sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. It was in God's good pleasure and in his will before the foundation of the world. He knew he was going to bring you into the family. I mean, let that sink in and just kind of sit on your heart for a little bit. It's, it's game changing. And so when you think about that and we, we kind of keep fleshing out this idea of Roman adoption, it also means that a child would be a permanent part of the family. That means that the, the parents couldn't disown the child that was adopted. This means we had assurance An adopted child not only received a new identity, but any prior commitments, responsibilities, and here's the best part, any debts were paid. And I'm not talking about financial ones, although yes, in the example, but I'm talking about the debt we owed God because of our sin. It was paid by Christ. And so the Spirit reminds us and convicts us that we are now children of God and reminds us of what Christ has done. And, and we also have these new rights and these new responsibilities we're taking on. We've been stamped. We've been marked out as children of God. And not because we've been marked out as children of God, right? We have this new identity. That also means we take on the name. And when we take on the name, that means we also take on the family business, which means we are ambassadors. What does Jesus tell in the Sermon on the Mount? To be salt and light. To let our good deeds shine before others so that others in heaven may give glory to your Father in heaven. And there's also this concept in ancient Rome of inheritance. That was part of life, not something that began at death. When you were adopted to a family, you received the inheritance right then and there. That's the same for us. Being adopted made someone an heir to the Father, joint shares in all his possessions, and my favorite part, fully united to him. You are united to Christ. You live in union with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's Galatians 2.20. Adoption in Scripture means we have a whole new identity and status before the Father. It means we share in and receive the benefits of Christ's work on the basis of His merit, not our own. And the Holy Spirit works to apply that to our lives. Let me paint it for you this way. I heard this from... One of my friends, he was sharing this story in a sermon he preached uh, about the Foot family in an adoption story. It says, in, uh, in August 2009, we got a rather amazing email from my wife's youngest brother, John. Six or seven years ago, when John and his wife, Lori, were working with a youth group in Nebraska, they met Amanda. 
a teenage girl the same age as their son, Wesley. Amanda came from a terribly abusive home and was eventually taken from her parents by the state. She's been part of John and Lori's family ever since. After conferring with their own two sons, John and Lori legally adopted Amanda. She is 22, and her name is now Amanda Foote. She will even get a new birth certificate. Now, John and Lori have three legal heirs, and Amanda now has two new brothers. She no longer has any legal claim upon her former parents who disowned her, nor they upon her. The process was relatively simple. They had thought of Amanda as their daughter for a long time. But I asked if anything felt different after the day at the courthouse, and John said this, Absolutely. When it was official, there was a huge change in Lori and me, sort of like when you see your newborn for the first time. And for Amanda, there was a change in her too. Now she knew she belonged. She knew where, who were her parents. And he goes on to say, The beauty of it all made me offer a word of thanks to our Father in heaven. And to Jesus, God's beloved son. God has given us a new name, his. A new legal standing. It means we're his responsibility, his heirs. And a new family of brothers and sisters in Christ. And with God as our true father. But God went even further. He gave us something that John and Lori can't. That can't give Amanda. God gave us his Holy Spirit. In some ways, it's like God gives us his own DNA. But even more than that, God implants in us his heart, his mind, his passion, his holiness. And people even look at us and say, my, how you bear a striking resemblance to your father. So we have to ask ourselves, how should my character be different in light of the fact that I've been adopted into God's family? First, we need to understand this. You need to make sure that you run towards God, not away from him, especially when you're wrestling with your sin. What do I mean? Think about our first parents, Adam and Eve. What did they do in the garden after they sinned? They went and they hid. It even says this in Genesis 3.8. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid because they couldn't be in the presence of God. Their sin had created a chasm. It smeared their relationship. They couldn't be in the presence of his holiness, and they had this fear. Sin had impeded them from them being able to be in his presence, and therefore it tarnished their relationship. But listen to what Paul says in Romans 8, 15. He says this. Paul says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. So because of what Christ has done, we've received the spirit of adoption. We don't have to fear the wrath of God. But rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. We have access again to the Father. We get proximity again because of what Christ has accomplished for us. Paul here is saying that there's a change in the relationship we went from enemies to children, and all by the hands of Christ. We no longer have to live in fear of God's wrath or the consequences of our sin because it's been satisfied, it's been paid. And now Christ has made a way for us to run back to God. Even if we stumble in sin, and this is one of my biggest fears that I have for people when they wrestle in their sin, especially as a son and daughter of Christ. They try to have a tendency to go run and hide when what we need to do is run right back to the cross. And repentance and remembering God's grace and mercy that we've experienced at the hands of Jesus. Remembering our new identity and all that God has done for us reminds us we have a security in Christ. And so second, to apply this identity, we must remember that we have an assurance that God will never cast us out. He'll never disown us or get rid of us. What does Romans 8, 16 say? It says this, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You're God's children. You've been stamped. It's been marked. It means you can't out the grace of God. It means you have security, assurance. It means that the believer, despite sometimes falling back into sin, will persevere to the end as a child of God. 
And then third, my favorite way of implying this idea of this new identity is that you have a new family. And you're sitting with them right now. She goes to look at each other. This is your family. This is your family. You have a new family. Adoption into the family of God means you get to experience restored community with God and with the rest of the saints. It means you have a family that will invest in you, that will pray for you, that will laugh with you, that will weep with you, that will hold you accountable, that will care for you as you guys heard today. We are one family. We are a group of redeemed saints who come together to worship and to to live this out in such a way that we are restoring community while representing Christ. That's our call as a family, as God's adopted children. So I leave us with this this morning. Kelly Nikondia in her book Adopted, the, the Sacrament of Belonging in a Fractured World, said this about adoption. She said, this is how adoption works. Like a sacrament that is a visible sign of inner grace, it's a thin place where we see that we are different and yet not entirely foreign to one another. We are relatives not by blood, but by the mystery of the gospel. All that divides us as nations, ethnicities, and different traditions is like a vapor that's quickly extinguished in light of our adoption into God's family. You see, the Spirit reminds us of our new identity as God's children. He reminds us all that we are one. We're one family. One family called in a fractured world that so desperately is looking for community. It needs community with God and it needs community with others. We know people's relationships with God have been fractured and we sense the division and the fracturedness out in our community. But we have this opportunity as one family, as we come to worship, all the dividing walls in our lives are tore down because we all come and we worship Christ. And we have this opportunity to live that out in our community such that we draw others in so they too can experience restored community and also go represent Christ. That's our call. We are one family restoring community while representing Christ. Let us pray. Abba Father, we ask you this morning that you send your spirit to remind us of our adoption into your family. Let us turn from our sin and live as your children. Let our light shine forth reflecting the family name so that the watching world may see our deeds and give you glory. And help us to be a family of one who lives in a community that embodies and represents your grace, your mercy, and most importantly, your love. And lastly, we thank you for living the life we should have and dying in our place so that we could be your children forevermore. And it's in the glorious name of Christ we pray. Amen.